All right, Ben, welcome. You are the co-founder of uh, DigitalOcean, uh, which is a uh, fantastic infrastructure company in, in general, but what's very cool is that it's also a New York-based infrastructure company, and not that many years ago it was unheard of, so you're very much part of that uh, leading, uh, you know, a leader in that new wave, so that's, that's super exciting. So maybe for context setting, uh, maybe tell us about DigitalOcean, what the company does, and maybe some metrics around number of customers and number of employees. Yeah, sure. So DigitalOcean is a cloud computing provider, so we deliver everything from infrastructure services like uh, storage, servers, uh, network, and we're also going up stack with uh, databases, uh, Kubernetes, and uh, object storage, uh, really helping developers to build modern applications in the simplest and easiest way possible. Obviously, you're all familiar with the big clouds out there. The challenge is that it's, uh, it's pretty proprietary, it's difficult to use, pricing is complicated, and support is lackluster. So our service tries to really uh, deliver an easy to use building block, uh, accelerate what developers can do, and minimize the need for operations. Uh, as far as kind of the size of the company, um, we're about 500 employees today. Proud to say last year we did over 200 million in revenue, and that's uh, seven years since uh, we started. How many customers? Oh yeah, quite a few. So we've had over a million all-time customers, over 500,000 that are active every single month, and that ranges from an individual developer, they could be in still in school, um, all the way to, to large enterprises. But really our sweet spot is uh, startups and small businesses that are looking for an easy alternative to the big cloud providers. It's pretty incredible. I want to go back to the very beginning. You mentioned uh, you have been doing, uh, you started the company seven years ago. What is the origin story? I think you had a company before this, right? Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So DigitalOcean is actually my second business. I started my first company in 2003, also here in uh, New York City. And it's just a kind of a passion project because I love servers and networking. I've been in a data center. Uh, kind of bleeding there, you know, installing servers since 99. And by 2003, I had the chance to start my own managed hosting company, similar to what Rackspace does. So uh, dedicated server, managed support services on top of it, everything from web database, security, backup, and uh, so on. And by 2011, um, you know, two things really became clear in that first business uh, the first is it was really painful to lose deal after deal to Rackspace because they had this great position in the market. Their tagline was fanatical support. Um, but even more important, Amazon Web Services had started to become mainstream. And so virtualization and cloud computing was starting to really dominate the landscape. And we became very concerned about a five-year outlook for that business uh, it seemed like dedicated servers were going to die, so we knew we had to really reinvent ourselves and had the luxury of some you know, cash flow and profitability. That was a bootstrap business, so not outside investors, and we took this uh, really big leap of faith, decided to step back from what we were doing and really analyze the landscape. Uh, but also took stock of you know what we were capable of and realized we knew how to run a business because we didn't go out of business. Uh, we knew the technology. We had about a thousand servers across the world at that point, but we didn't really understand marketing and positioning. And so it was really a good time to start to learn the uh, the softer skills and how to sell a product at scale. Uh, in addition to all the technology chops that were really a core core expertise. But in 2011, as you mentioned, AWS was already a, a thing, right, that uh, was going super fast. So you guys decided to start a competitor to AWS? What, what was the thinking, I guess? Yeah, so on one hand, yes, that's exactly what we did. More, more importantly, I think we really put the customer first and really understood what they were looking for. So we basically targeted the, uh, the developer and more specifically a modern web-based, you know, kind of using a modern framework or a modern language. 
and thought about what are the challenges and difficulties that they have in getting their job done. And it turned out that while AWS is a great tool, there is a pretty big steep learning curve. It's difficult to use, as I said. We actually ran a little group uh, study one time and we had a few uh, comp sci students come in. One of them was from MIT and he wasn't actually able to get a server launched from the AWS wizard. And so we knew that the problem definitely was, was real and what we wanted to do is enable these people to, to build more, to build faster, you know, just see what they can produce because obviously software is starting to eat the world. There are more and more companies every single day and when you're small, you don't necessarily need to choose an AWS. They may not be the best fit. So we wanted to make sure that you know, we were the best in terms of user experience and our, our core values around simplicity and ease of use. Mm -hmm. And the, the positioning was around the lower tier of the market in terms of size. Is that correct? Well, we definitely wanted to be an entry-level place for uh, creation for these uh, businesses and developers that are building something new. And so obviously, naturally, you're going to start from, from nothing. But the good news is that we've been able to scale with our customers. Some of our largest accounts are spending over a million dollars a year with us. They're using thousands and at times tens of thousands of virtual machines plus you know, a slew of other services that we offer today. But the idea was to help that initial moment of creation, get people back on their path of building their application, building features and functionality, rather than trying to figure out how to manage their servers and their infrastructure. And I think with this initial positioning, you talked about the power of constraint on the business and how that creates the discipline that you need. Do you want to elaborate? Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is very universal. Whenever you're trying to uh, attack a hard problem, sometimes it's great to really uh, list out the constraints that you want to apply to that problem. So, you know, in our case, we had an up and running business and we wanted to build a better company. So what, is, what does that actually mean? And uh, we said we wanted it to have a monthly recurring revenue subscription model because that would build a great revenue base for the business. We wanted to have a unique position in the market and that was extremely difficult to figure out uh, how do you enter the cloud market that was essentially dominated by AWS and it turns out simplicity was that um, kind of differentiation. We wanted to stay within the domain expertise that we had around networks and servers and just the data center. And um, I feel like I'm forgetting one other thing, but the point is it's counterintuitive in terms of you're really placing these constraints and so solving for a smaller problem can actually uh, lead to a more abstract and kind of general solution that will scale much better over time rather than making something very complex and specific to a, you know, a, a point in time. And then what typically happens is as that solution starts to scale, it can actually break down and won't really deliver on the test of time. And you know, it's really amazing for me to be able to say that seven years later, our position really hasn't changed. It we're still the simplest, easiest to use cloud out there, you know, really proud about that. And so you know, using these constraints, we were able to build a business that's extremely scalable. And how does that manifest on a daily basis almost, uh, this, this idea of constraints? Does that mean you say no a lot, no to features, no to customers that are not qualified maybe? Well, we don't say no to customers. Uh, we love all of our customers, <laughs> although there are quite a few that try to bend the rules and, you know, great place to mine bitcoins and run phishing scams and things of that sort. <laughs> So we have to... They need servers too. They do. And we apply some pretty fair uh, set of analytics to try to weed them out. It's, it's difficult in, in a large customer base. Um, I'm sorry, the question... You, yeah, how does, that, how does that mean if you say yeah, no right, to like right. features or... It's actually one of the biggest challenges that we have, especially in the product team, where you're actually trying to build something that the customer is going to love. That's one of the other key um, kind of core values for DigitalOcean is how do you 
how do you put love into your work and how do you get customers to love the product that you're building? And I think it takes a tremendous amount of uh, empathy and really understanding what the customer is trying to achieve. And so um, we've had countless heated debates in the office, you know, to the point of screaming and yelling at each other and trying to figure out what, what is actually going to serve the customer best. So, you know, it's also one of the things that we use in the kind of interview and recruiting process because um, everyone from investors to employees will ask, well, how are you guys really any different than AWS? And the challenge is that, yes, you're providing the same basic service underneath, but how do you deliver that with simplicity and ease of use? And so it's actually a very difficult problem to solve because you're, you're taking ownership over that complexity. And, um, you know, it's, it's easy. It's actually easier to build a complex solution because you can throw all these different things at it. It's much harder to build something that's simple, elegant, easy to use and can still scale with customer needs. I mean, in terms of go to market, you sell to developers, right? And I guess as developers gain more and more prominence in the enterprise, there's more and more companies trying to sell to developers, but there seems to be a wide spectrum of success. And uh, some companies seem to magically capture the, the hearts of developers, others completely fail. Anything that you learned there in terms of what to do to get developers to love your product? Yeah, I think it's about choosing a, a side, if you will. You know, we obviously chose the developer side. We're much stronger there. You can also choose to go into a more enterprise-oriented solution. And uh, I think there's a big difference between the two. So with developers, what made us unique is, once again, putting their needs first. And, you know, developers love solving problems. But also when there is a problem, they need to learn and figure out what's going on. So one of the things that we did very different is we built a community of content. We've written in a couple thousand tutorials on how to leverage open source. And chances are you've read some of these articles uh, searching for different solutions. And we write about databases. We write about different data storage uh, engines. But we also write about you know, web servers and, and so on. And we get about 3 million visitors a month. And I think it was this concept of giving back to developers, enabling them, accelerating their education, helping them solve problems that really helped uh, us to resonate with this community. And so we have a really high NPS score of uh, nearly 70, which means that people really love this service. And so they do a great job of uh, introducing it to a friend. It's kind of like watching a great movie on the weekend chances are you're going to tell somebody about it on Monday. And uh, that's exactly what we're seeing where referrals and kind of organic acquisition are really the largest uh, driver of, um, of signups for, for the company, which means the, the product does exactly what, what it, we say it does and uh, customers gain a ton of value from, from that. So I think it's about really understanding your customer base and giving them something of value without necessarily charging for it, like this free content and uh, education in our community. Let's talk about fundraising a little bit. The previous business was entirely bootstrapped. For this one, you've raised a significant amount of venture capital. Any lessons learned or recommendations for anyone thinking about fundraising for the business? Yeah, that's... Um, I would say try, try to make it on your own as much as possible. Leverage uh, debt, credit cards, um, whatever you can, you know, just everything but VCs, <laughs> everything but VCs. And I think there's, you know, there's two reasons to go to, uh, to a VC. One is you have started to prove out a business model. You understand how, how to accelerate the company. You might have some working capital constraints. Um, and you're re you have some, some traction and some proof points, I, I would encourage you at that point definitely to uh, you know, talk to VCs. They'll give you good feedback as well on how they view uh, you know, your company and your opportunity. I think that's, uh, that's, that's invaluable. But uh, you, know, you don't necessarily want to do that too often because, uh, or too early rather. You want to focus on the customer and figure out what they're really going to value because a VC can sometimes you know, send you down a wrong path. But I think the other opportunity is if you just have a great idea um, and 
it might be so audacious that there is no other way to bring it to life other than you know connecting with a capital source and an investor that believes in, in your mission and your vision. Uh, that that's an amazing opportunity as well. I just felt um, you know it was a little too crazy to just go out there and raise millions of dollars for for a pipe dream. So. Plus, we had the benefit of the first company that allowed us to build DigitalOcean and gain into a, you know, a place where we had traction. And then, by the way, the investor conversation is also a lot easier because if you can bring to them a business model, you know, uh, a few months of revenue or a customer base and, and feedback, that makes your idea that much more believable and, and accelerates the time in which you can fundraise. Um, you know, I think we had a good run in terms of we spoke to about 10 to 15 investors in each of our rounds. And you know, I've heard of other entrepreneurs that have spoken to 150 and may not have necessarily closed the round. And by the way, when you're raising capital, it's a huge time drain that you aren't necessarily to, able to leverage into building your business further because you're trying to find capital. And so I would encourage people to really try to bootstrap, try to make it work. And when you need capital, that conversation will go a lot smoother if you have that traction behind you. Yeah, and at a very practical level, do you want to talk about some of the hacks you use for bootstrapping, you know, server leasing, deferred payment plans, that, that type of thing, debt, any, yeah. any useful thing that people could use? I mean, just figure out how to use other people's money, really. A, a, great, a great example. Uh, we had our <clears throat> launch um, kind of event at the New York Tech Meetup here in New York, another big event similar to this one. And there was a law firm there, Gunderson Detmer, that was a sponsor of, of the evening. And they basically said, hey, come pitch us your startup idea. If we like it, we'll provide you with all the legal services and we'll defer payment until, you know, in the, in the, in the future. And so I had no idea, by the way, how much legal work you actually need to do, but I took them up on their offer. They thought we had a good enough idea, and so we started working with them, and I'm super thankful we went down that route. So I think the idea here is, you know, how can you find sources of capital that aren't your own? And so, you know, debt is another really good um, example where, you know, we've, we've raised more debt than, than venture capital. And venture, we've raised $123 million, And I think we've raised roughly like $300 million in debt because we use, and we still to this day use debt to buy all of our servers and storage um, and, and networking equipment, all the CapEx for the business because it just, it's that much cheaper rather than taking on the dilution and bringing on an equity investor. So I'd encourage everyone to really think outside the box and you know just try to find capital wherever you can. Raise from maybe friends and family. They'll give you a much better valuation than someone on the outside. You know, leverage credit cards. Um, you know, or you know, even with um, AWS or DigitalOcean for that matter, we all have incubator and accelerator programs with a ton of credit. Uh, you don't have to pay for you know, your web infrastructure for a couple of years, which should be more than enough time to really get that idea off the ground. So now people can leverage your money. <laughs> All of our, yes. Our <laughs> All comes full circle. All right. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, let's uh, switch to scaling a little bit. So um, as you mentioned, so now you have a bunch of employees, uh, tons of customers, uh, very impressive revenues. Uh, maybe let's talk about the recruiting aspect of um, of scaling. Uh, what, what did you learn there? Yeah, the two kind of quick takeaways are one, uh, recruiting becomes your number one job when you're really scaling a business. Um, there were months where I spent more than fifty percent of my time in in recruiting, and um, you know it's 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 very challenging still here. I'd say in New York City to find. Kind of the right talent. I think it's great that this ecosystem continues to evolve. Um, there are people moving here from all over the world. There are more technology companies than ever before. But when you go back, you know, to the early 2010s, um, that talent pool was still a little bit limited. But anyway, if you're in a high growth, high scale mode, and you're spending, you know, all your time on recruiting, I think that's actually a good thing. And and the second is as you bring all these people into the business. You know, the um, complexity with which you can follow a vision, go down a single path actually begins to magnify tremendously. And so you want to focus quite a bit on culture and basically 
the simplest way to phrase it is, um, you know, when you, when you have a couple of people and you're all in constant communication, you know what's going on, it's pretty easy to know what's expected. When you onboard or bring 100 people into the business, how do, how do they know what to do? How do they know how to make a decision? That's really what culture is all about, helping you know, that next set of hundreds of people figure out the, the right set of decisions to make um, when you're not there because you won't be able to spend time with every single team and every single person. Quick word on culture. Um, and I think we, we messed it up in the beginning, uh, to be quite honest, because what, that's actually one of the constraints that we didn't use. Um, but over, over time, it became pretty apparent. Uh, I think it was 2013, we grew from 30 people at the start of the year to uh, about 120 at the end of it. And I was now spending 80% of my time dealing with people problems. So we hired a VP of people so I could just delegate all those issues to him. And at the same time, we said, okay, we have to really codify our culture, write down our values and our principles. And that really helped us to move forward. But I do think that, you know, if I was to start a business again, definitely that would play into the foundational elements, much like the technology, the product, the go-to-market, uh, and, the, and the culture, I think, are really the, the key foundational elements of any company. Great. All right, just maybe one or two last questions from me because I want to uh, leave plenty of time for people to ask uh, questions. Uh, so maybe switching back to the product and the technical aspects. So you mentioned Kubernetes. What, what, what's uh, exciting and important to you guys in terms of um, trend that you want to be able to leverage, whether that's Kubernetes or serverless, any, any sort of technical aspect you're excited about? Yeah, well, technology is moving very quickly and it's um, exciting in some ways that the virtual machine, which was essentially the, the start of DigitalOcean, is now starting to slowly begin to kind of phase, you know, phase out and you're starting to see containerized uh, applications become much more uh, dominant. You know, they run within virtual machines today for the most part, but I think that's just uh, kind of a legacy artifact, obviously. Uh, containers on bare metal would be much better. Um, we're starting to see obviously functions and serverless beginning to take on more and more workloads. And so for us really it's uh, once again how do we put ourselves into the shoes of a developer to help make their life easier. And the thing about Kubernetes or about any of these abstraction platforms is that they give you greater leverage and greater scale but typically that ab abstraction also brings more complexity to, to the problem. And so we spent a lot of time, almost a year in development on building the API and the user interface for Kubernetes. And I'm super proud to say that um, Kelsey Hightower, one of the co uh, core contributors to Kubernetes and over at uh, Google, our, our friendly company, uh, actually surveyed a bunch of different providers delivering Kubernetes services and said that DigitalOcean provides the best developer experience and is the simplest and easiest to use even over the uh, Google Kubernetes engine service. And so I know we're doing a really good job in, in helping to serve our customer. And you know, I think that obviously the virtual machine is a little bit of overhead. I think that you know, apps are gonna be a lot more uh, stateless. I think they're gonna be uh, microservices are you know, starting to become dominant. And uh, in order for that transformation to happen, I think the cloud providers are going to have a hard time trying to figure out the multi-tenancy uh, part of the equation, but that's certainly where the world is headed and in functions, you can already begin to see that. Great, thank you. All right, uh, do we have some questions on here? So, digital testing now in the new testing to be substantially remote toys. Um, how does that help building the culture and getting the uh, yeah, well, we decided day one that we would have um, remote and distributed teams as part of our, our, our approach. And even in the first company, we already had remote employees. And I think that's what made us very comfortable with this, um, with this idea. And uh, we have a fantastic people operations team that puts the remote employees almost ahead of the employees within the office. And so all of our events, we think about how can we get the, uh, the remote employees involved. Obviously, we use a lot of asynchronous communication, Slack and, and email. 
Um, but we also have opportunities to really come together in town halls and other kind of all hands meeting formats. Um, it actually turns out that our remote employees are just one or two points more engaged than our in office employees. So I think, you know, that's really one of the advantages of a remote culture is that you can leverage talent pretty much anywhere in the world. Um, we still primarily hire within North America and Europe. Um, it's been a little tricky with time zones uh, to really get into Asia, but we do have kind of some support teams out there, customer success teams local to that customer base. Uh, but it's exciting to build a, a remote enabled culture. And um, did you start the remote uh, part from the very beginning? Was it always part of the culture? Yeah, yeah we, we thought, thought that, that remote would actually be a kind of a differentiator for us because we were not that hopeful that we'd be able to find all the talent that we need in, in New York City, unfortunately. And it kind of, you know, played out. Maybe it's because we, we thought that way to begin with. Uh, but it's been kind of challenging to find people that have experience with infrastructure that um, have seen com companies scale uh, to you know through high growth and um, you know and and to find all of that in New York City at the same time while competing with you know financial services uh, is really a tall order. But I'm I'm really glad that you know a bunch of our employees have gone on to start amazing companies. So it's great to see you know that kind of ecosystem continue to evolve. And, you know, we have about half of our team, so about 250 employees here in New York. And I hope that they go on to do some amazing things as well. Hi, um, my name is David, a uh, data scientist at Galvanize. And uh, love your product. And uh, I know, you know, ML and ML on the edge is very much growing. Wanted to hear your thoughts on that as a new modality for infrastructure for your product offerings? Yeah, so Edge is um, not, not something, something that, that we've tackled tackle just yet. yet. We're in uh, highly centralized data centers. Uh, nonetheless, I think that it really comes down to the software. The harder, you know, the harder problem is, is, is that it's not building the physical presence. And so I think also in the data center space, there are some new players that are building out kind of edge co-location uh, facilities. Um, Vapor.io, I think, is the one that really comes to mind. And so I think also it's, it's matching the customer demand. We haven't had as many kind of uh, requests for, for edge. We certainly see a lot of customers talking about how can we leverage ML and kind of AI workloads on DigitalOcean. I think for us in our roadmap, we have to deliver a GPU-based uh, solution first, and we're working on that right now, so that's exciting. Because if, if you think about it, right, like I think many people in this room have this uh, challenge. Sometimes you need to crunch a new data set or try out a new data uh, project, and if you have to go to AWS today, I'm sure you're gonna really enjoy you know, spinning up that new server, spinning up that new project. And what we're trying to achieve, we just launched actually a marketplace as well where we're inviting uh, third parties to come in and build a quick stack. And so now with you know, just a quick credit card, click of a button, you can get up and running um, nearly instantaneously, allowing you to rapidly prototype. But I think Edge is where we're going. We're not there just yet. All right, one more. Do you try to evolve developers to what you like? I mean, I work for a, for a company called Conservatives that does a job like that, and it's interesting way to find them for the training to go to the company. Yeah, that's a great question. I think when we were first starting, we were certainly of the mindset of let's get into the kind of popular approach. Let's enable these large communities of developers that already have determined their own best practices. Let's build out a core set of primitives that they could use. And now that you know that roadmap has taken a lot longer to deliver than I uh, expected. I thought it was a one-year roadmap. It took us more like five. But the exciting thing is that we are actually getting closer and closer to that bleeding edge where I think we can bring new standards and new ways of working um, and, and really leverage the community to help us with that. I think one of the biggest uh, challenges that we all have is, you know, it's 
become code, um, sharing code, code collaboration is pretty much a proven thing. You have GitLab, you have GitHub, you have a few different workflows for that, but there isn't a universal way to take that, that code and really deploy it onto a server architecture and then certainly to scale and manage it over time. And I think that's an area where DigitalOcean can really make its presence felt by leveraging open source, using uh, you know frameworks and uh, an open approach because then you'd be able to lift this, uh, this recipe or this framework and run it on any cloud provider and kind of help combat you know, this, uh, this closed proprietary vendor lock-in that's happening today. So we're not there just yet, but I'm really excited about being able to define new standards in, in the near future. Wonderful. Ben, this was amazing. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Absolutely.